Hello, happy Tuesday. Welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Morose and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Jody Daniel Simon, who recently completed her PhD in Ecology and Environmental Biology at the University of Waterloo, will be speaking about grassland passerines are sensitive to the cumulative effects of oil and gas development in Southern Alberta. And just a little bit of business before we begin, PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series is a monthly presentation, either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in a Saskatchewan community on anything to do with Native Prairie conservation or species at risk. Our next Native Prairie Speaker Series webinar is on Monday, June 22nd. Dr. Ryan Brook from the University of Saskatchewan will be discussing wildlife research during a global quarantine, tracking the rapid spread of invasive wild pigs in Canada. That's Monday, June 22nd at noon. We will be hosting a webinar about identifying invasive weeds by Melanie Toppy of the Frenchman Wood River Weed Management Area on Tuesday, July 7th at 3 p.m., so save the date. And PCAP will be celebrating the 21st annual Native Prairie Appreciation Week from June 15th to 19th. In addition to a photo contest, we will be hosting daily webinars about range health assessments and plant identification. And you can check out the PCAP website, www.pcap-sk.org, for information and to register for upcoming webinars. All past webinars can be found on the PCAP YouTube channel. This one will also be recorded and uploaded to the PCAP YouTube channel later today. I would like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our gold sponsors, Eco-Friendly Sask, Pembina Pipelines, Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, and Wildlife Habitat Canada. Our bronze sponsors, Camp Wolf Willow and Rancher Stewardship Alliance Inc., as well as Environment and Climate Change Canada. A reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the questions section of the webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation. Questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Now a bit about today's presenter. Dr. Jody Daniel Simon is interested in how changes in environmental conditions, whether driven by climate or land use activities, affect biological communities. She applies tools and concepts from landscape ecology, community ecology, and geography to investigate how plants, birds, and aquatic macroinvertebrates are likely affected by climate and land use. Jody recently completed her PhD in Ecology and Environmental Biology at the University of Waterloo in Dr. Rebecca Rooney's lab. In 2015, Jody completed a Master's in Natural Resources Management at the University of Manitoba in Dr. Nicola Copper's lab. And it's extra special today because Jody is calling in all the way from Grenada in the Caribbean. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to Jody and want to thank you ahead of time for, for calling in from such a long distance. All right, um, so I'd first like to say thank you for joining in. And first, I'd like to say thank you to the Native Prairie Speaker Series for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, this work is coming from my master's thesis, as um, Caitlin mentioned, uh, when I was in Dr. Nicola Cooper's lab at the Natural Resources Institute within the University of Manitoba. Um, as Caitlin mentioned, I am in the Caribbean, and that's where I'm from. Um, we have a tendency to talk a bit quickly. I will try my best to ensure that does not happen, but I apologize if it does. Uh, but generally in today's talk, I'll be sharing with you some of our findings um, where we were really trying to get a better understanding of how different oil and gas infrastructure cumulatively affected grassland songbirds within Southern Alberta. So to begin, Temperate grasslands are described as one of the most at-risk biomes globally, generally because of habitat loss, which simply refers to the loss of grassland area 
and habitat fragmentation, which simply refers to grass and patches being divvied up into smaller pieces as a result of, let's say, human activity. We do know that based on recent estimates, we only have about 50% of native prairie re remaining. And most recent losses, most recent degradation has been attributed to oil and gas development. Mostly because, well, it's believed that this is because much of the oil and gas deposits within this region also overlap in areas where you find um, a wide abundance of grassland habitat. We do know that wildlife do show sensitivity to oil and gas development. And so in order for us to minimize impacts on populations, we have to not just consider the individual impact of one type of infrastructure, but also take into consideration the cumulative impacts. And one particular um, group of organisms that are critical in this conversation are grassland songbirds. We do know that recent estimates up to 2014 suggest that we're seeing about a 70% decline in grassland songbird populations. And the reason why we focus on activities in areas like Alberta or even Saskatchewan uh, is because activities on breeding grounds are activities that happen where these birds are breeding are believed to have a larger impact on their population viability than activities that happen in areas where they're wintering. And so in order for us to even attempt to minimize this population decline we're seeing or even slow it to some degree, we have to take into consideration activities happening on breeding grounds and we have to take into consideration impacts associated with oil and gas development because we've seen increases within the last decade. Historically, much of the loss of grassland habitat has been attributed to agriculture. We do know that within the region, the topography is generally flat and this is conducive to grazing as well as cropping. Generally, when you are removing grassland habitat for cropping, we tend to see massive declines in the diversity and the abundance of grassland songbirds that would be present. And this is simply because the, the preferred vegetation characteristics that these grassland songbirds may prefer or are no longer provide or no longer available. And so typically on these cropping areas where you have increases in cropland activity, we typically see birds like corn marks, um, which prefer bare ground. But in the absence of that, we're, we're really losing a lot of the diversity in grassland songbirds. Another impact, as I mentioned, has been grazing. Generally, when we have grazing activity and it's minimal or not heavy, um, this can produce some benefit to grassland songbirds simply because um, the cattle are acting like historical grazers, like bison. And their grazing, um, if patchy, kind of produces that type of vegetation heterogeneity that would allow the area to support different types of grassland songbirds. So some birds might prefer areas where the vegetation is short and sparse, whereas others would prefer areas where the vegetation is dense and tall. So when we have increases in these talking rates or the number of cattle grazing or pressure on grassland ecosystems, and you lose that, that diversity or heterogeneity in vegetation characteristics, that can result in us having a similar circumstance with cropping activity where you lose a lot of the diversity in grass and songbirds for the same reason, which is you no longer have the preferred vegetation characteristics that they require. As I mentioned before, we do know that more recent losses in habitat, grass and habitat can be attributed to oil and gas development. Um, and two main mechanisms are often used to explain this impact. The first being noise. We do know that oftentimes when we have noise associated with human activity, either through noises from an oil well or even noises associated with um, vehicular access, sometimes the sounds produced can overlap with the frequencies at which birds may communicate. And because it overlaps in their um, communicating frequencies, the birds are not necessarily able to communicate with each other as effectively. And another impact we can see in addition to noise is habitat alteration. And what happens when you install a well or you install a compressor station, which I'll discuss a bit further in a little while, you have the mixing of the soil. And the mixing of the soil oftentimes exposes it to um, the seeds from non-native plants. And many of the plants like crested weed grass, for instance, when they now dominate the area that a new well is installed, no longer have the vegetation characteristics that many songbirds prefer. And consequently, we often see that areas that have 
a wide, um, wide abundance of the native plants at Crested Wheat Bass typically have less diverse um, grassland songbird populations, again, because the vegetation characteristics that they prefer is no longer available. Now, the study I'm going to talk about um, really happened in southern Alberta, and we do know that recent estimates suggest that Alberta was the third largest producer of natural gas and crude oil globally. Um, in the region, in Alberta, there are four main types of infrastructure we're taking into consideration when I'm talking about oil and gas infrastructure. And the first being shallow gas wells. So shallow gas wells are allowing an individual to access natural gas. And the natural gas is getting, it's coming from the surface, um, from the earth's surface to the top. It's not using any type of pumping mechanism. It's just simply an avenue to get the gas from within the earth's surface to the top. In order for the gas to be transported to areas that one may require it, uh, they have to be pressurized at the specific intervals. And this is where compressor stations come into play. They ensure that the, the, the necessary pressure required to transport the gas is kept. Um, I should note that in the work I'm going to be discussing, um, compressor stations were not a type of infrastructure we took into consideration, but we did look at the impacts of shallow gas wells. Another type of oil and gas infrastructure that we can talk about would be um, oil wells. So oil, crude oil, you'd find below natural gas. And if the, prep, if the depending on the volume of oil um, in the earth's surface, you can get the oil naturally moving from um, below the earth's surface to the top because of the difference in pressure. But sometimes in some areas, because the volume may be a bit lower, there isn't sufficient pressure that would allow the oil to get from the earth's surface to the top. And this is where these oil wells come into play. So the picture on the left is showing you a pump jack and the one on the right is showing you a screw pump. And what they're doing through, by making a pumping mechanism is that they're creating an artificial lift that takes the water, sorry, takes the crude oil from within the earth's surface to the top. Um, and that's why they're typically noisy. It's because that pumping mechanism is necessary in order to get the oil from the earth's surface to the top. So the three types of infrastructure we're going to be talking about would be shallow gas wells, which are, trans which are getting natural gas out, um, as well as oil wells. Now, another type of um, impact to take into consideration, which I may not necessarily call infrastructure or roads. We do know that when you have the installation of a shallow gas well, they can be accessed through paths and trails. So that type of associated impact may not be as high. But when we're talking about oil wells, which have to be visited pretty frequently, we need to access them through roads. And roads by themselves do have impacts on grass and songbirds. As I mentioned before, noise can have impacts. And, and because of noise, it can affect birds' abil abil ability to communicate. But an additional impact of noise is, of roads, sorry, is that they fragment habitat. And as I mentioned before, when I'm talking about fragmentation, I'm simply saying that the grassland area is being divvied up into smaller pieces or smaller patches. What happens along these, these um, areas where you have fragmentation along roads is that predators often use them to find food and in a sense are looking for prey. Um, and for this reason, we typically see that um, birds that may be forced to exist near roads are more vulnerable to predation but also some birds knowing that may avoid roads uh, for that simple reason. So wild roads may not be noisy, even if there's, um, because let's see, not as much traffic is passing back and forth. They actually can affect birds simply because you have um, changes in vegetation structure around roads. Um, as the same mechanism I talked about with habitat alteration, it happens when you install a new well, or you can also have increases in the abundance of predators along these roads as well. And taking all of this into consideration that we have oil wells, we have shallow gas wells, and we also have roads, we are really interested in getting a better understanding of to what distance do we see an impact of these different types of infrastructure at the local level. So if you were to look across all the sites we surveyed, on average, to what distance do we see an impact of roads, oil wells, shallow gas wells, um, as well as roads. We are also interested in looking at the density to which there is an effect for shallow gas wells specifically. Um, the reason why we didn't take into consideration oil wells, which you'll see a bit later, is because their densities within our region were really um, much lower compared to um, 
shallow gas wells, for example, within a one square mile um, area, the average oil well density was about 1.2 um, compared to shallow gas wells where you can get as much um, as 16 per section. Another type of um, question we had is how would the presence of these different types of infrastructure impact habitat use? So when I say habitat use, I'm referring to abundance and how it would affect productivity. When I speak of productivity, I'm talking about clutch size and nesting success, which I'll discuss later. So what we're doing here is we're trying to understand, okay, these infrastructure have impacts up to X and Y distance on, up, um, on abundance, clutch size and nesting success. How does this impact these populations at the regional level and not just at the local level? And the final thing we were interested in looking at is what are the relative effects of different types of infrastructure at the regional level? So we know that there's an impact up to a specific distance. We know that there may be impacts at the regional level. How do the impacts compare? Um, how do the impacts compare when we contrast them? So as I mentioned before, uh, this study took place in Southern Alberta. Um, the study region we're looking at goes for up to the US border in the south to the Saskatchewan border to the right. And then um, this star you're seeing here is the city of Brooks and we're going about 50 kilometers north and about um, 25 kilometers west. You would note, as I mentioned before, I mentioned before that shallow gas well densities were much higher than oil wells. And you would see here in the picture, the first one that's noted as shallow gas wells, that the density of shallow gas wells is pretty high compared to oil wells. This entire figure just covered with dots, which is telling you there are a lot of shallow gas wells. Um, and then also we are looking at the impacts of roads, and this is just showing you where, where roads are. I should note that we did not um, differentiate between um, highways, for instance, between um, smaller secondary roads for a point of our analysis, we're taking into consideration all roads in the area. So as I mentioned before, uh, we were looking at habitat use as well as productivity and habitat use I'm referring to would be abundance. So abundance surveys were conducted in 2010 and 2011 um, within one square mile um, fields. And within each field, we would do um, 10 point counts. So what would happen is a technician would get to the site, um, to the plot, sorry, and within 100 meters, they would record all birds they've seen and heard. If you are interested in some of the results that came up from some of those surveys, you can check a publication in the bottom, which is by Rogers and Cooper in 2017. Um, that specifically was looking at um, how abundance varied. Um, depending on shallow gas well presence and shallow gas well density. So if you're really interested in looking further into what we found there, you can check that paper. So in addition to abundance, we looked at nesting success and clutch size. Um, so these were connected, these surveys were connected between 2010 and 2014. And what typically happened is you would have two technicians, they're holding um, 30 meter rope with tin cans attached and they would drag it within the field. If they notice that a bird flushes or a bird flies up, they would then search for the nest and if they find a nest, they would mark it. And then this, the nest is revisited every two to five days. So from this, from monitoring the nest, um, they would record the highest number of eggs they saw as the clutch size. And we'd also record uh, whether, whether or not nesting was successful. So if at least there was at least one successful chick from there, one successful shush, um, fledgling, then we would consider nesting to be successful. And as um, before, if you're interested in looking at some of the findings from studies that were using this clutch size and nesting data, uh, they are mentioned in the bottom of the slide. So we have one by Dr. Cooper and Brennan Placid, and also you have one by you and Cooper in 2017. So just some additional things if you're really interested in finding out some additional findings. So obviously when these surveys conducted, there were many species that were detected, um, but for the purpose of this particular work, we focused on five species. The first is the chestnut collar longspur. So this species is listed as listed on the, the species at risk act, and it is typically associated with areas where you have short um, and sparse vegetation. 
Um, and these are typically areas historically that would have been disturbed by fire. Another species we looked at would be the Sprague's pivot, and this is also listed under the Species at Risk Act. Unlike the chestnut hall longspur, it prefers areas with tall, taller, denser vegetation. Yet another species is the savanna sparrow. So savanna sparrows are pretty abundant. Um, they are, they're described as one of the most abundant grassland songbirds you can see. Um, they are described as area sensitive, which simply means that in order for them to nest, um, they would prefer, they have a specific amount of habitat they will require, a large amount of habitat is required in order for them to establish an area to nest. And also, because they're pretty abundant, um, we typically see them in a wide range of different types of vegetation characteristics, unlike the Chestnut crawl along sperm scraps with it. We also looked at Vespa sparrows, and these, um, these are typically associated with areas that have shrubs um, because they like to perch. And finally, we looked at Western meadowlarks, which are also pretty abundant, like savanna sparrows. But unlike savanna sparrows, they are not described to be area sensitive. So now I'm going to talk to you about some of the, our findings. Um, first, I should note that we ran about 60 models that were our attempts to best understand the impacts of the different types of infrastructure and abundance, cluster size, and nesting success. And I'm going to show you results from four, four of our models, four of the best, best models. So the dashed lines you're seeing here are confidence in intervals and around the breakpoint. So the breakpoint is a point at which there's a change in the relationship. So in instance here, um, the breakpoint for this figure here, I would estimate is about 1,250 meters. So there's a change in the relationship between abundance and distance of oil well around there. And the, the dashed lines are giving you confidence associated with that. The black lines is giving you now the predicted abundance. And finally, the gray line, the gray ribbon is giving confidence, the confidence interval. Now, important to know that wherever you see an asterisk, that is saying that there is a significant relationship here. So firstly, we're looking at the relationship between predicted abundance and distance to oil wells for savanna sparrows. So what we saw is as you get, let's say, you're right next to the oil well and you're getting to about 1,250 meters, there isn't really a significant change in the abundance of savanna sparrows. But above 1,250 meters, we see a significant increase in the abundance of savanna sparrows. And this is suggesting to us that there is a negative effect of oil wells. Um, yes, savanna sparrows maybe may, could be observed around them, but we see a significant increase after we get to some distance above. Now let's look at the same thing, but we're looking at um, Sprague's pipettes. As I mentioned before, these are listed on the species at risk at. So we note here that we're looking at the predicted abundance um, as it relates to the distance to an oil well. And we'd note that as you get further away from an oil well, the abundance of Sprague's pipettes increase significantly as indicated by this asterisk here. But when we get to this breakpoint, which we estimated was under 100 meters, we see no change in the abundance. Again, this is suggesting a negative impact, though slightly different for um, Sprague's pipettes and savanna sparrows, where Sprague's pipettes are in some ways avoiding, they're avoiding being near oil well. In this case, now we're looking at the influence of shallow gas well density on clutch size, and I mentioned before, clutch size is just referring to the number of eggs. We see that below a density of about seven, of a below a density of about five, we see that it isn't really um, a relationship. But when we get to the above five, um, five gas wells per section, we see a significant decline in savanna sparrow um, clutch sizes, which is suggesting to us that there is a negative impact of gas well density once we get to more than five gas wells per section. And the final figure I'll show you here is looking at next nesting success. So we're looking at what is the probability of nesting being successful depending on the distance to shallow gas well. And here we're seeing as you get further away from a gas well, 
we're seeing increases in the probability of nesting being successful. And then after we get to about 50 meters, there isn't much of a change in the probability. So overall here, um, I've shown you instances where there, were a negative, there was a negative impact of, of infrastructure on habitat use and productivity. But I should know that there were instances where there wasn't an effect at all, or there was a positive effect. So generally, we did see mixed effects, um, but generally the effects were negative when we looked at the species that the species at risk: chestnut call, long spurred, and sprags pivot. So now we have we understand yes, the effects of these competitive infrastructure are generally negative, but there are instances where there are no effects, or instances where the effects can be positive. The next question is, on average, to what distance do we see an effect? Um, as indicated here, um, oil wells, surprisingly, um, the distance to which there was an effect was a much shorter. This was followed by shallow gas wells and then roads. So this is suggesting to us um, that the effects of roads go to a further distance than the effects of oil wells. Should note that the distances between um, to which there was an effect um, we're within the same range, but clearly we're seeing that the effect is ranging well beyond a thousand meters or one kilometer, which is much further than what than we would have anticipated it to be. So after we now understand that yes, there is a, there are mixed effects, and yes, that oil the distance to which there is an effect of oil wells is much shorter than that for roads, so there isn't much of a major difference. We are now interested in seeing. How do these impacts translate to the study area or the region? So the first species we're looking at would be chestnut call long spurs. The lighter the green, if the green is a lighter shade, it means that the area is considered to be um, not optimal or poor. And if it's green, it means that the area is optimal. So um, that's, that's a scale range. So if you look firstly at abundance, we see that generally, um, there are areas where um, abundance is predicted to be much higher, but it's somewhat patchy. But generally, we see throughout this study area that abundance is average. Abundance is about within the range of this um, index we've created, could range between 0 0.25 to 0 0.75. So average abundance. Now, when we look at crotch size, the story gets a bit different. We'd notice that there are some areas, example here, where I'm pointing out to the, with the pointer, and here, where clutch size is much higher, but then there are areas where clutch size is predicted to be very low. And then finally, when we look at nesting success, we see a similar story. The areas where nesting success is predicted to be higher, example here, areas where it's predicted to be lower, example here, but clearly we're seeing that the areas where clutch size is predicted to be high are not necessarily areas where, clutch, where nesting success is also high. And this is suggesting to us that depending on the measure we're looking at, either but, um, habitat use or productivity, birds are affected differently. So chest and log, curl, long spurs may be relatively um, widely abundant, moderately, but the areas where their clutch sizes would be really well, would be really high or not necessarily areas where they would experience high nesting success. So now let's look at savanna sparrows. Here we see um, that generally um, they are pretty abundant. The abundance is ranging within the index of 0 0.5 to 0 0.75. Now, when we look at clutch sizes, we see that generally the clutch sizes are not necessarily high, but there are areas where it might be, as I'm pointing out here. Now we look at nesting success, however, the story changes again. Where, yes, there are areas where, where it's predicted to have high nesting success, example here. But again, we're not seeing general strong correlations in areas where abundance, clutch, clutch size, and nesting success are necessarily high. So again, the way in which infrastructure up, up affects productivity may not necessarily affect abundance. And now let's look at sprags pivots. Same story, they are moderately abundant in the area predicted to be. And now when we look at clutch size, we see that clutch size is not necessarily predicted to be high everywhere. Um, example here, clutch size is predicted to be optimal here and here, 
but generally we're not seeing a strong trend as with the other species. But again, the same trend of areas where abundance may be predicted to be high in this general region here, may not necessarily be the same areas we're seeing high clutch signs. Now we're gonna look at Vespus virus. Now we look at abundance, we see that there are areas, patchy areas where abundance is pretty high, those dark green spots. But generally the predicted abundance is predicted abundance is patchy. So some areas are very high and other areas it's not necessarily expected to be high at all. But most of the region is predicting lower abundance. Now when we look at clutch size, we see that it's a bit different. Um, clutch size, um, most of the region would experience are predicted to experience higher clutch sizes, contrary to abundance. And then when we look at nesting success, it's predicting pretty high nesting success generally throughout. Um, but if you're not necessarily having high abundances as shown on the left, um, the net benefit of these high clutch sizes and nesting success may not be have the large impact on the population of the year. And finally, we look at Western meadowlarks, we see that their abundances are predicted to be high in some areas, but it's pretty patchy. Um, the reason why we do not have a clutch size and nesting success model is because Western meadowlarks showed weak sensitivity. They were not sensitive to, they didn't show much sensitivity, sorry, to oil and gas infrastructure or roads, um, as we saw with abundance. So overall, we can take this to mean that um, there isn't a consistent response, um, depending on the different types of infrastructure we're looking at. But when we look at abundance, productivity, and nesting success, the species are not necessarily showing strong correlations in areas where their abundance, clutch size, and nesting success will be optimal. And this is because the way in which infrastructure affects one measure, abundance, may not be the same way it affects another example, clutch size. And this was consistent for all the species we've looked at. So now that we see that there isn't much of a consistent, consistent effect of infrastructure on abundance, clutch size, and nesting success, we are now interested in seeing um, if we were to translate this at a regional level, what percentage of the area is affected by the different types of infrastructure? We saw that oil was affected the largest, smallest portion, not surprising because the densities were pretty low, as I mentioned, it's about 1.3 per section. Then we have shallow gas wells. Um, them, as I mentioned before, their densities are much higher than oil wells, so it would be unsurprising that the cumulative effects are much higher. And then when we look at roads, their effects they are affecting a larger portion of the um, city area than the other two types of infrastructure. So the next question is, what would all of this mean? Um, generally, we see that when we compare the distance to which is effect of the different types of infrastructure, they are relatively the same. And what this is suggesting to us is that the impacts are not necessarily explained by noise because oil wells are, noise, are noisy, shallow gas wells are not. So if the, imp if the mechanism explaining the impacts of this infrastructure was noise, then oil wells, the distance to which there was an effect of oil wells should be much larger than that of shallow gas wells. And so what we're taking this to mean is that birds are probably likely being cued by the physical presence of the infrastructure. So they, in this relatively flat ecosystem, when a bird arrives in an area, they may see the infrastructure from far off and be cued, maybe I shouldn't select that area for nesting or maybe I shouldn't select that area um, uh, for foraging. What does it mean for the species of risk that we're looking at? So we looked at savant, we looked at sorry, chestnut call, long spurs, as well as sprouts pivots. And we noticed and we noticed that um, generally there were large effects um, and the impacts were generally negative. When we looked at savannah spurs and western middle arts, they showed mixed effects, but the negative effects were consistent for chestnut call, long spur, and sprouts pivots. And this is of concern because these species are already listed under the Species at Risk Act. And if they are being such so largely next, so, such large, such so large, such largely affected by infrastructure, this means that the, this region may not necessarily be bol bolstering their population numbers, um, as you will like, simply because you have this cumulative impact of different types of infrastructure affecting their productivity, different than it affects their habitat. When we look at species that we would consider to be less sensitive, like best sparrows or even savannah sparrows, we did see a similar trend. Um, though, though 
they showed um, weaker sensitivity to infrastructure. Um, we are seeing a consistent trend of there being trade-offs. So maybe the presence of, an, of, of infrastructure may benefit a species that likes perching, like a Vespa sparrow or a Western meadowlark. But then it then means that maybe their clutch sizes or their nesting success is lower because um, maybe food availability is not what it should be in that area, or maybe they're more sensitive to predation. So there are trade-offs happening here, but the trade-offs are such that we're not seeing consistent areas where the abundance, the clutch size, and nesting success would be optimal. So generally, um, what has this, what can we take this to mean? Um, firstly, um, we see that effects, the effects of which there's a distance of which uh, there are effects of infrastructure are pretty far. Um, a lot of studies have suggested that there are um, the effects lasted to maybe a couple hundred meters, but we were detecting effects well beyond a hundred meters. And this may not be great because even we would assume that perhaps if we have optimal vegetation structure around a well, um, or maybe the well is not as noisy, um, words may not necessarily be affected, but because they're affected well beyond 100 meters, it's suggesting to us that we need stronger interventions when we're considering um, these species. And as I mentioned before, the distance to which there is an effect well beyond 100 meters. When we look at habitat use and productivity, um, we see that even if you're looking at a species that is supposed to be disturbance relatively less sensitive than the others, we're not seeing strong correlations in areas where the nesting success, such as an abundance, should be high. And this is suggesting us that there are trade-offs, um, trade-offs in when birds are selecting habitat. And these trade-offs then mean that they may be cued to an area because it might seem like seem okay, but in fact they're not necessarily getting the habitat requirements or the food requirements they need to be productive. I have have high nesting success as well as have high clutch size. Um, and when we take into consideration cumulative effects, um, we're seeing that. The effects vary depending on the different types of infrastructure we're looking at. Um, oilers being the lowest and um, shallow gas wells being much higher. But because the birds are being cued by the infrastructure itself, it's suggesting to us that maybe what we should be putting time into is designing, ensuring that we're in the design in the landscape that we should move away from having above ground infrastructure. Um, one instance I believe would be using um, The word is not coming to me, but the general idea is that you're able to access um, resources, maybe be access um, gas wells, gas for instance, um, from one single wellhead. So you may not necessarily need 16 within a section. It's possible to be, have designs where you're accessing um, natural gas from one wellhead via one wellhead. Um, an additional um, change would be um, there can be differences in design with oil wells to ensure that you don't necessarily need to have these permanent access roads to access them. So that's another difference that could, could benefit these um, species simply because roads do have an impact. And so we really believe that in designing, well taken when, when designing landscapes, when uh, permitting different types of development in an area, it's really important to consider um, what does the current state look like? If we're approving, let's say, a uh, type of development that has an above ground infrastructure, the question then becomes how much of the area already has above ground infrastructure? And maybe we don't necessarily need to put another, maybe we need to find a way to access what's already there without having these cues that birds are actually avoiding. So it's not just taking into consideration what happens at the site level when we're designing spaces, but also taking into consideration how does this area fit in to the larger context. And the last thing I'll see on that is, it's really important, particularly because the areas where we're seeing birds having high abundance, clutch size and nesting success are pretty minimal. And so if there are areas that are predicted to be optimal, then those are maybe areas that we should avoid the certain further, simply because by losing that, what we may think to be an insignificant patch um, could have a large scale impact simply because it's one of the few areas where birds may experience um, adequate um, consumer from predators, um, adequate food availability, and their preferred vegetation characteristics.
Um, I'd like to thank all of our funders. Um, without them, this research would not have been possible. I'd also like to thank the many field technicians that contributed to the data, contributed in collecting the, these data that, that, we, that we used. And so if anybody has any questions, I'm free to answer them. Thank you so much for the fantastic presentation. Um, thanks for sharing all of your, your knowledge and um, experience and data with us today. Um, to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard. And uh, Jody, we do have a few questions here. Um, the first one is, what can um, oil and gas companies take away, or environmental companies um, take away from your research? Um, I would say the big takeaway is as much as we can, I would say two things. The first being that as much as we could avoid above ground infrastructure, I think that benefit birds as much because they are being queued by the presence of, presence of infrastructure. So one thing I'd mentioned um, where you're able to access um, access natural gas from a single wellhead, that can have vast benefits simply because you're not adding more visual cues that boys birds would, would avoid. And the other thing would be when we're um, considering areas to, let's say, install a new well, we should really take into consideration how does this area play into the regional habitat quality available for these birds. So is this area of optimal quality? And so maybe we should be considering um, placing this infrastructure elsewhere, or maybe this area is already degraded to the point where abundance, clutch size, and nesting success already know, so the, the large scale impacts on the population may be minimal. So really it's avoiding above, uh, avoiding above ground infrastructure as much as possible, and to take into consideration how does this local area feed into the regional habitat available for every species. Thank you for that answer. Um, a listener named Kirk would like to know, for noise effects associated with oil wells, gas wells, and roads, were you able to control for variable use levels on roads, like the actual noise levels, and whether oil wells, like the pump jacks, were actually operational or not? Uh, yes, the I can say yes, the oil wells and um, pump jacks were operational during, during surveys. Um, but I don't, we were not able to control for differential impacts of roads, and, and that's a clear um, limitation. One, we couldn't really, we couldn't really, um, we didn't really separate roads that would have been super active, let's say on highway, versus a road that may be a, a tertiary road, which may be visited less frequently. So that is one thing we didn't, weren't able to take into, take into account. Thanks for that answer. Um, a listener named Krista would like to know if you um, saw an interaction between native grassland density and oil and gas infrastructure in how nesting success, abundance, or clutch size is impacted. Were areas with high density of grassland versus uh, cultivated land somewhat immune, or were there the same negative impacts? So um, that's so cropping activity was something that we initially planned to take into consideration. Um, but um, in the experimental design for the larger study this was part of, um, the hope was to avoid cropping areas. So when I initially looked at the data, most of our sites were in excess of 3,000 meters away from the closest that the, the closest the plot closest to a cropping activity was about 2,000 meters, two 3,000 meters. And so because we didn't have the range of dis distances um, necessary our analyses really couldn't take into consideration the additional effect that um, cropping activity could have. But obviously that's one of the issues with um, our model. It's a best estimation, but there are, we could really be underestimating additional impacts associated with agriculture. Okay, and along those lines, um, a listener named Kirk would like to know, um, for the uh, chestnut collared long spare, he believes that you indicated um, they prefer slightly taller grass communities. Yeah. And in your study, air no? No, um, so the chestnut collared long spares prefer areas with short sparse vegetation, with the scrags that prefer taller dense vegetation. They do differ. Okay, yeah. okay, perfect. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, and. Krista, uh, another listener again, would like to know if um, there are any provincial oil and gas regulatory bodies that are using your research to update infrastructure density regulations. Um, so I do know um, 
Dr. Coper will be able to answer a bit more of that. Um, but I do know that our research, we partnered with Synovus Energy. So those are one of our funders. I believe, um, well, one thing I do know is that um, our research or findings generally is given to them um, yearly. Um, I don't know the degree to which it's incorporated in their um, management practices, but I do know that our results and data is shared, is shared, are shared with them. Thanks for that answer. Um, a listener named Troy would like to know if uh, the use of drag lines and um, repeated nest checks were considered in your analysis as a potential impact. Um, potential impact on nesting success? No. Um, we, oh, you mean like the sites being frequently visited by us and so it's like we're queuing them to a predator, if there was an impact in that way? But yeah. assuming, okay. Um, no, I don't think it's something that was not something that was incorporated into our analyses. Um, but the I would say the way in which the nests were flagged, um, we used as it was inconspicuous as possible. Um, generally, like when a nest is flagged, we have like a big drawer, and we would have that kind of tells you the general area, and then a smaller drawing that tells you where it is. So. From very far away, it's not really easy to see where it is. So the GPS and the drawings get you as close as possible. And then you're just really looking for these little cues someone left. Um, you try to best ensure that you're not we're not walking back over the same path. So as much as possible, we try to ensure that we're not queuing the site, queuing the nest uh, predator. But obviously, even with us doing that, the predators are way, they, they have a better, I think, ability to see these things than we do. So. That is possible, but I don't, it's not something I was able to account for in my analysis. Thanks for that answer. Um, in your study, you looked at um, three types of infrastructure. Do you know mm -hmm. of research um, about other types of land use activities that would impact birds? Uh -huh. So um, I know compressor stations can be an issue. Compressor stations are ridiculously noisy, right? Um, from the instances where we passed near them, there was no way I could imagine a bird um, being able to communicate with them. But I do know um, the other studies that came out from the COPA lab that looks more closely about really interrogating the question about the impacts of noise. And I believe they had a playback experiment um, where they had like a, they had like actual wells um, compared to fake wells where you put that in, where you just put a recording off a well in the grass and see if there's an impact. Um, so I think if you check out Dr. Cooper's um, research gate, you may be able to see some work they've done there. But I believe that, I think I've read work from Bain, I think Aaron Bain, and I think they did work with impacts of noise. Um, I'm trying to think of other stuff I've read recently. That's, and I think there was, a, I think a Thompson 2015 paper that also looked at the impact of infrastructure as well. And a Caitlin Bogard paper in 2014 or 15. Um, so there have been different types of work that has looked at the impact of different types of infrastructure, but most of them I think have been like compressor stations, shallow gas wells, I believe. Um, my, I could be wrong, but that's, that's what I'm remembering right now. But our study was just looking was taking it more at the regional level impacts and not just at the, the local level. So yeah, those might be some ways to find other studies. Yeah, thank you for that answer. I know um, Dr. Copper's lab is a great resource for, for mm -hmm. ongoing research about um, grassland songbirds. Yeah. Um, a listener named Gary is, um, is wondering if you know anything about the impact of um, solar and wind turbines on grassland songbirds. Um, or is that outside of your scope? I would say a bit outside of my knowledge area, but I do remember I did go to a presentation at the University of Waterloo, and there was a prop that came in and was talking about the impacts of different types of infrastructure, and even mentioned, um, was it wind? But they had mentioned that whole idea of that visual cue affecting birds, but I can't even, I'm not able to tell you who the person was or what the paper was. I just remember it was a talk I went to. Um, no problem, thanks. Yeah. Um, a listener named Anne would like to know if um, if any of the well sites in your area investigated were reclaimed, and she's interested in um, just to see if reclamation played a part in available habitat. Mm 
Um, I believe um, possibly, possibly. Um, the sad thing is the oil layer that we were working with um, did not have as much detail as I would have liked on, on some of that stuff, but it, it, I think it's highly possible that some of the areas were, were claimed, highly possible. Okay. Um, I think that's all the questions that we have. So um, with that, I just want to thank you again for the fabulous presentation. Um, and to all of our listeners out there, um, thank you so much for, for catching our broadcast today. Uh, when you leave this webinar, a survey will pop up and it's a quick one minute survey. If you don't mind filling that out, we really appreciate it. Then we can report back to our uh, program sponsors and we can keep our Need to Pray speaker series going into the future. Um, so I guess with that, thank you so much. Um, thank you again, Jody, and have a great rest of your day, everyone. All right, thank you. Bye. Bye.